Well, good morning or good evening, everyone, wherever you may be watching. Um, welcome to our first webinar Wednesday and our webinar Wednesday series. Um, today's webinar will be Access First Generation and Underrepresented Students. Um, we are very excited to have you join us um, today for the webinar. Let me put up our presentation that we will be going through. Um, so this webinar will be recorded, um, so please be aware of that, but you will not be seen or be heard during our time together, but there is the wonderful Q&A box that we hope that you are sort of asking your questions throughout the presentation, and we'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes at the end um, for a total summary of sort of Q&A here to sort of chat with you all and answer any questions that you are curious about. Um, so today I am joined by wonderful colleagues from two other institutions, um, and we will introduce ourselves. So my name is Caitlin Oliver. I'm one of the senior assistant directors of admission and the coordinator of college access and inclusion at Franklin and Marshall College. I've been at the college for, this is my fifth year, but I'm also an alum of Franklin and Marshall, graduated in 2016. Um, and I've been working there ever since. I'm really passionate about sort of higher ed and access in that. So I'm very, um, I'm looking forward to our conversation um, this morning and I'll pass it on to my colleague, Christopher. Good morning, everybody. My name is Christopher Munoz Colleen. I'm Assistant Director of Admissions for Access and Inclusion at Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, before Clark, I was in Germany uh, in graduate school. And I think my experience there kind of sparked my interest in higher ed, um, specifically, you know, my own time being a low income student from Florida applying to schools outside of Florida. Um, so I'm really happy to be here and thank you all for joining us and I'll pass it on to Luis. And then um, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, like Caitlin said, wherever you may be, welcome. Uh, my name is Luis Portillo. I am the Assistant Director of Admissions with the University of Delaware. Um, like my colleagues, uh, the passion for access and equity is extremely, extremely important for me uh, as a minority first generation, uh, proud Salvadorian American uh, in this country that was able to, to get to college and, 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 and live that American dream to this, to this point in life. So uh, I'm so happy to be here with you, you all. Um, this is my ninth year in admissions. so. I guess I'm the old dog on the block right now, which is which is weird because I'm used to being the younger one. So this is awesome. I appreciate the, the invite. Yes, of course. Thank you both for joining us um, today for our webinar. And so today we're going to walk through a lot, right? We're going to go through a lot about the college process, um, about your search process, and sort of provide you some tips and tricks to help you navigate um, this you know, some of you may see it, see it as sort of unseen, unknown. We want to make sure you leave here today with sort of a general basis of what to ask um, in terminology. So we're going to talk about admission terminology. We're going to talk about those co-curricular activities that your school counselors may be talking to you about. Talk about engagement, what to ask, best fit and what that means. Briefly go over financial aid. Um, and then end with a question and answer. So admission terminology. So there are a lot of words on the screen um, and this is sort of, <laughs> don't worry, don't stress. I will be going through each of these terms. Um, so the first terms that I have on the first bullet point are basically different types of applications. We have the common application, which is, you know, a general admission undergraduate application that applicants use. Um, to more than 800 member colleges and universities in 49 states and in Washington, D.C., as well as Canada, China, Japan, and many European countries. What is nice about the common application is that you only have to put the information in once, and then you can send it out to as many colleges that accept the common application um, as you can. Of course, there may be some application fees attached to each application, but in order, but to put in your app, to put in your information and to create an account, it's free. So this is a great option for students to apply to colleges. Then we have um, the newer version, the Coalition app, which is another free application um, that 
is sort of described as popular media as a direct competitor to the Common App. Um, this sort of form of ap application, you know, there are schools that take this um, app. And again, it's you putting in your information once and then sharing that application with um, different schools. Um, this application uses sort of a locker where you can organize and store um, different materials, upload a portfolio, um, and it sort of looks a little different than common application. But again, it's a general, general app. And then we have the college specific application, which some colleges use. Um, so they don't wanna use the Common App, they don't wanna use the Coalition App, they wanna use their own application. And some schools that utilize their own specific application are um, the California State University System, the University of California System, Georgetown, Loyola University of Chicago, MIT, um, the Military Academy, West Point, um, and the Naval Academy. So those schools, you'll have to go on their website to see sort of what information they're looking for um, and fill out their specific application. So there are a lot of ways to apply to college. So that should not be a barrier. And we'll talk about, um, you know, the fee waiver that's associated with sort of applications as well. But I did want to talk about sort of different um, application cycles um, in admission. The first one being early decision. An early decision is a binding agreement between you and a college. Um, so there's something called the early decision agreement form that you, your parent or guardian and your school counselor will have to sign. Um, there is an earlier deadline for early decision, but what's nice about it is that you'll find out in a quick you know, month turnaround for some institutions. But understanding that if you get accepted through any round of early decision that a school may have, you are binding and committed to go to that institution. Some schools only have one round of early decision. Some schools have two. Um, some, some schools may even have a third round. Um, so that is the binding agreement. Then we have early action, which is an earlier application deadline as well, but there is no binding agreement. So you will find out early of your decision, but you are not binded to attend that institution if you apply through early action. There are schools that have both early decision and early action. There are schools that just have early decision and there are schools that may just have early action. So making sure you know the distinction between early decision and early action is very important because of that bonding, binding and non-binding decision. Then we have a regular decision, which is the general admission pool. Students, the deadline is usually in the winter. They find out in the spring and they have until decision day to decide. And of course, this is non-binding. This is the larger pool that usually a lot of um, students apply through. Something to understand is that with early decision, um, you know, students may still apply regular decision to other schools, but once they find out their decision through early decision and if they're admitted, you will have to withdraw your other applications from regular decision pools. Um, so understanding that. And then rolling admission. This is a continuous cycle that many schools have um, where you know there you could submit your application, you'll find out in a few weeks of a decision, and you know, schools do that um, until they fill their class. So that's sort of what it's literally a rolling process and a quick turnaround, of course, non-binding. Then we go on to the fee waiver because applications to colleges have fees. Um, and this is a really great resource for students who may not have the money to sort of submit, you know, $55, $65 to seven or eight schools. So there are different types of fee waivers that students can re re request um, or apply for. There are fee waivers that are college specific. So if you reach out to your admission rep and see if they have fee waivers for students, there are fee waivers through College Board that if students sort of fit into a certain socioeconomic bracket, they will qualify for a certain amount of fee waivers, similarly to how with the SAT and the ACT, you may have a fee waiver to take the test. That's the same for applications. Um, and then schools and like institutions may do sort of a campaign where they sort of say, if you apply before this date, your application is free. Um, to the institution. So definitely if you 
do not have, if you don't have the money to sort of submit an application, there's, you know, ways to ask, find a resource, a mini um, sort of for you to submit an application. So that's what a fee waiver is. It's really funny because when I was going through the college process, I would call it a free waiver because I was like, oh, they're getting free applications. <laughs> and then uh, going into the profession, they're like, Caitlin, it's fee because it's waiving the fee. Fee. And I'm like, oh, that makes more sense. So yes, the fee waiver, <laughs> not the free waiver, but it does, it allows you to have a free application. Then we have holistic review, which um, is an evaluative process um, as we are evaluating applications where everything factors into an admission decision. So academics, co-curricular and extracurricular activities, um, the essay, your recommendations, um, sort of what are you going to contribute to the community, um, and sort of the learning and um, the process at the institution. So that's sort of what holistic review means, um, which I think is a really important term. And that's a really good question to ask sort of schools, like how do you evaluate applications? Because um, not all schools evaluate it in a holistic review. Um, so it's really important to make sure you know sort of what is a school prioritizing in terms of evaluating of an application. Then we're gonna jump sort of into the financial piece um, in terms of how applications can be reviewed. So we have the need blind process, which is a college admission policy um, in which an institution does not consider financial need when deciding on an admission decision. So your finances are sort of like whited out. All they see is your application in terms of making a decision. Then we go to need aware or some schools call it resource aware, which is the opposite. And in that institutions sort of will take a student's ability to pay tuition into consideration um, in their admission decision. Schools who sort of go toward need aware, they may not have unlimited funds for financial aid if they meet sort of 100% need and they don't have unlimited funds that need aware process, they wanna make sure that they can agree to that commitment. So that's sort of the need aware process where finances are taken into consideration and that may be holistic review. And then need-based financial aid is financial aid that you receive if you have financial need and meet other eligibility um, requirements. Um, and the thing about need-based financial aid is that you cannot receive more need-based aid than the amount of financial need. And this is based on the FAFSA for some schools, the CSS profile, and uh, my colleague Luis will explain more about the FAFSA and the CSS profile when we go into financial aid. Whereas merit-based aid, which is also called merit scholarships or merit awards, is financial aid offered in recognition of your achievements, whether it be academic, athletic, things of that nature. Going into sort of the EFC, which helps sort of explain need-based aid is your estimated family contribution. I mean, this is a number that colleges use to determine how much financial aid you're eligible for. Um, the EFC is a calculated sort of formula that ties in sort of your FAFSA, um, families tax and untaxed income, assets, benefits, um, such as unemployment or social security. Um, and also it considers family size and how many students um, you have that may be in college or going to college. So that's sort of your EFC, which can be calculated, which then plays into a role of how much need-based financial aid um, you can receive. And then demonstrated interest, which is a term that some schools may use, which are ways applicants show if they are really sort of interested um, in an institution. Demonstrated interest can be sort of seen as, you know, answering emails, reaching out, visiting the campus, attending virtual sessions in these days, um, just showing that interest. And some schools will factor that into a decision. Um, it depends on the school. And then your deposit slash enrollment fee is what you have to pay to accept your spot when admitted to an institution, which will hold your spot. Um, something important to know is that, you know, an enrollment fee, if, if institutions say it, is something that you will not get back because it is a fee that is non-refundable. So understanding that um, is important. So I know that was a lot of terms. And if you have any questions, we will definitely 
um, I can answer them and you know we'll reference some of these terms throughout the presentation. And then I'm going to quickly just go over co curricular activities. Um, and why they are important in the application process. And as you guess, they help provide insight to the things that you're interested in, things that take up time um, or things that you're passionate about. And they're also skills that sort of help you develop um, to make you a better um, person and applicant in the process. So co-curricular activities that you can include on your activity sheet on the application can be activities in school or out of school, community involvement, internships and work experience, family responsibilities if you're taking care of a younger sibling, an older grandparent, um, because that's what they are showing. They're showing um, sort of who you are as a person and what you do outside of your academics. Um, they're, so really putting anything that takes up your time is really important. So put on those family responsibilities, put on your work experience because you know, that's taking away from sort of your academics. Um, and, you know, being involved is really helping you develop skills you need to succeed from time management to organization to interpersonal skills, discipline, professionalism, uh, which will only benefit you um, when you go off to college. So now I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Chris, who will go into engagement. Great, thank you. So my biggest hope uh, for all of you when we're talking about engagement is that you will do more than I did um, when I applied to colleges. So when I applied, I was fascinated by all of the schools that I was considering. Um, I went on their websites regularly. I went to their YouTube channels. It was a different era of YouTube, but still they had videos that they were putting up. Um, but I never did anything beyond that point. And I think I missed out on getting a sense for what is life actually like uh, at this school? What are the classes like? Um, what is a day in the life of a student? So those qualities that I loved about, you know, what I saw on the website, I never actually got to hear stories or examples that would really show me what that experience could be like. Uh, and the bottom line of what I want to tell you is this. Uh, this is about finding a place for you. So you, you really want to keep your own interests in mind. Um, it's not about engaging with schools and hoping you know, if I ask the right questions and I seem a certain way, that'll be really good for me. Um, I think if we take that approach, then kind of 90% of our attention is on how do I sound? Was that a good question? You know, we're kind of overly self-conscious when we approach engagement that way. Um, and your own interests get pushed to the wayside when we do that. So if you show up focused on learning all that you can for you, 100% for you, uh, then your curiosity will show authentically and organically. You won't even have to worry about how it's being perceived. Um, so if you look at the slide, I've, you'll see I, I never got past step one, <laughs> the initial research. I never made it quite past that point. Um, initial research is necessary. Um, so you don't wanna jump to the interview, right? If you've never done the initial research. So think of them as building off of each other. Um, I, you know, you wouldn't want to go into an interview with a school that you don't even know that you like yet. So, so just keep that in mind, but do go beyond that first bullet point of what I did. Um, so after you researched a bit, take a look at some of the virtual offerings. So this is a good chance to hear actual people from the community talk about their school. Um, when I was applying to college, I could not afford to visit any of the schools that I was looking at my first day at my college. Uh, the first time stepping on campus was move-in day. Uh, so they were all out of Florida from, you know, my home state. So in this time, a lot of schools are doing virtual sessions. So my encouragement is to take total advantage of those sessions. Uh, and again, with an eye on the fact that it's really for you. Um, you're doing it for you. You're not doing it, you know, to make sure that you've checked off the box that, yep, they see that I saw that I did a virtual session. Uh, Focus on what you can learn from that session, ask questions. Um, and you can do that even starting right now, by the way. So if you do have questions, um, put them in you know, the Q&A and let us know. Um, so the next bullet point is something I wish I had also done, which is uh, you are so welcome to email admissions counselors at the schools you're considering. Um, so I had no idea about this when I was in high school. I think the curtain in my imagination just kind of dropped 
like I didn't picture that there are actual people and there was specifically someone assigned to me uh, in the admissions offices of the schools that I was considering. That will very likely be the case at nearly all of the schools you're applying to. So just so you know, I read applications from Florida and New York City, for example. If a student from New York City emails Clark admissions, that email will get passed along to me. Um, and I always say in emails, feel free to ask questions as they come up for you. So this is, I'm trying to say with that, but you don't need to time it perfectly. Um, there's no, you know, I have to ask three questions or every three weeks or something like that. Um, I once had a student ask, can I email you at after 5 p.m.? And I said, yes, I mean, I get emails all the time. Uh, I won't necessarily read something at midnight, <laughs> but I will answer you the next morning. Um, so uh, I just want to communicate that out loud because I think sometimes it can feel like, oh, no, I'm going to bother them or they don't want to hear my questions. But I will never roll my eyes <laughs> when you send me an email. If anything, I'll be happy if I know your name and recognize it again. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, the next step I want to highlight is the interview. Uh, again, something that I did not do that I wish I could tell my 18 year old self to have done. Um, so I encourage you to feel free to ask what to expect in an interview because schools, it can differ from school to school. Um, but I think in all cases, the interview is a really good chance to engage one on one. So these are kind of questions that are a little bit deeper. Um, you know, and when I say deeper, I mean, you're in a one on one conversation. So that's the kind of question you want to ask where they'll give an answer and you might go, oh, can you say more about that? Or it might spur on a question for you. So uh, it's not bad or wrong to ask questions that you can find the information easily to online, but it just doesn't serve you as much. You know, if someone asked me a statistic uh, that's on our website, I'm not angry, obviously, but I wanna try to give you more context because I think you're asking more than just that number. You wanna ask what life is actually like. So if you ask me the student faculty ratio, I, I, if I just gave you the number, I don't think that I would be doing my job very well. Um, and, and same, you know, you can approach the interview that way too. You want beyond that number, right? You're curious, what is the relationship like between professors and students maybe? So I would say my encouragement is to get really clear on some of those questions. And what do I really want to know by asking them and be ready to follow up and remember that it's for you. Um, finally, so the application really gives a chance to show all of this engagement that you've done. Um, so if I've spent all this time learning about a school, you know, I watched the sessions, I emailed questions, I did an interview. Um, I want to demonstrate that, that, I, that I've done my homework and that I'm clear that this could be a place for me. Um, I think applications offer a really great opportunity to, sh to demonstrate that, but also to reflect yourself. Like, this is a chance to pause and go, okay, I, I'm applying to the school. Why am I applying to the school? What about it did I love? Uh, and so that's, that's again, that redirection of attention back to this is for me, um, if I choose to view it that way. Um, so uh, I did actually wanna say on the next slide, just an example of um, how you could find the admissions counselors if you were curious. So I'll just use Clark's website as an example. So. On our admissions page, we have a meet our counselor page. So if a student writes that they are from Florida, you'll see just a random school in Florida and then counselor name and then email address. Um, and then if you click on the next slide, you'll see, so many schools will have something like this. Um, and, you'll, and actually, um, you, you, my email is really easy to find right there as well. Um, you know, these are meant to show that we're actual people, that uh, you're welcome to get in touch with us and you'll see the drop-in hours. So um, some schools are offering kind of additional ways to get to know us because in a typical year, you could maybe come to campus and then make a meeting with me and now we'll just do that virtually. <laughs> so if you are, you know, curious about Clark or any of the other schools you're looking at, um, maybe they don't have that option, you know, built in on the website, but you never know if they would be open to meeting with you. So you can always just email and ask, you know, the worst thing is to still say, I don't have the time for that. I'm sorry, uh, but they'll engage with you in other ways. Um, so I want to be mindful of the time and just 
zoom a little bit through these questions um, that I've prepared for you. So what I'll say up front is that if you do, if you would like some of these questions or you found some interesting and you want to know more, you, you, you can email me and I'll send them to you. That's no problem. Um, and this is recorded, so you can look back later too. Uh, but I will say just the first category admissions, um, you know, this is something um, that you might want to ask about specific components in the application. Like I already mentioned the interview, you might want to know how does that work? When would you recommend that I sign up? So if there's any kind of component in the application that you want just more clarity around, like test scores and your test optional, but you know, uh, does that mean I'm at a disadvantage? You know, people ask those questions all the time and it's absolutely okay to do so. So the next section is academic life. Uh, you might wanna be connected with someone who studies a major. Uh, you, and again, this is back to that ratio that I said, you know, a lot of schools might say, 10 to one student faculty ratio or something, but but really you wanna know, are the professors involved in my success? Or, you know, what am I really trying to learn from that question? Um, so if there's some kind of experience you would like, like research, like how accessible is it actually? Uh, and you can ask current students, admission staff. Um, so the next question is daily life. You might be curious, what, what is the literal daily life of a student like here? So. Um, the reason why I, I'm such a proponent of engagement is I know my own process around this where I would see an image on a school website like, oh, there are students smiling on a lawn in front of a Gothic building. And then I would just make all these associations in my head about that must be what they do all day or, you know, it's just like this one image where I picture it means everything. And in reality, that's one sliver of what life could be like there. Um, so asking what is the literal day-to-day -day life at this school like? Like, tell me, walk me through a day. Um, our students get those questions and actually I think they have a lot of fun answering them. So you're not a nuisance if you want to know more. Um, so, and then next is just resources. This is something I did not consider at all <laughs> when I was applying to colleges. And um, especially as a low-income student of color, I think it would have been, it would have definitely served me to ask these questions about resources um, and also how accessible are they? Um, do people really use them? You know, how, how do they look? Like at Clark, we have a physical space for students of color and first gen students that can totally shape an experience. You know, we have, you might have the same percentage of students of color at a different school, but school A and school B can have utterly different experiences even with the same demographic number. Um, so keep that in mind. And uh, with that, I think we can pass it on to, oh, no, one more point. <laughs> this is actually the most important. So I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad I put this at the end. Um, strengths and areas of improvement. Uh, so it's, you wanna know what are kind of like the reasons why the students ended up picking this college because likely they got into a couple schools and they chose this school. So what made that decision for them? Um, but you also want to know what are the areas of improvement. Uh, I would not recommend, I've heard this question phrased differently, like what do you hate about your school or what do you like least? That I would say um, that can lead to a kind of negative answer. And I think if you set it up more like what's an area of improvement of the school? What can the school work on? Um, students who love their schools, I think also know that there are areas of improvement and they want to see the school do better in certain areas that invites a more kind of mindful, um, helpful and hopeful response. Um, so anyway, all of those questions will be on the recording. So, uh, and like I said, email me if you'd like to know any more, um, but I, with that, I'll pass it on to Louise. Awesome, appreciate you, Chris uh, and Caitlin. <clears throat> um, the first and foremost thing, when you're talking about fit, uh, I always talk to my students especially my students from underrepresented communities, students of color, um, that, that get a lot of surrounding noise around them, you know, the, about where you should be going to school and stuff like that. And, and I always remind all my students, regardless of where you go, it is not who you'll be, okay? Um, college is not meant for you to go to and find a job and then find great paying career, et cetera. While that is a component of it, it is not the meat and potatoes of it, right? Um, I tell my students to remind, I remind my students that college really is a place for you to go to learn academically, grow academically, but it is also a place for you to go and grow as a person, find out what your values are, 
what your morals and your beliefs and where you stand in this world that we that we live in, you know, uh, especially here in this country right now in this political climate, that you need to know who you are and what you stand up for. Because if you don't stand up for anything, you'll fall for everything, right? Um, next slide, please. When talking about fit, uh, I know Chris talked a little bit about questions that you should be asking, but the questions you should be asking before you get to those questions is the size, you know, big versus small. What type of student are you? You know, are, are you a student that can sit in a classroom of 450, 500 plus students in an English lecture hall where the only interaction with the professor that you have is at the end of the semester because normally it's a teaching assistant or a graduate assistant? Those are questions you need to ask yourself. You know, Michigan, University of Michigan, phenomenal school, right? Phenomenal school. Massive school, <laughs> you know, if you think about the size of it versus a smaller school like an FNM or, or a school like a, a Randolph College in Virginia. Um, size of the school correlates with classroom size. You know, bigger schools will probably have larger classrooms with, for introductory classes. You know, and a lot of schools, you know, I, I've been in the profession, like I said, nine years and I've been to a lot of college fairs and, I'm, and I've stood next to a lot of different schools and heard their spiel about student uh, to faculty ratio and how it's always somehow 15 and 12 to one. And you're just like, you're a big massive state school. Like Delaware, we, we tout a 18 to one faculty, uh, student to faculty ratio, but the question, or, or a 12 to one student to faculty ratio, right? But the question that we're not telling students to ask is what's your student to teaching faculty ratio? I don't know about my colleagues, but I'm considered faculty on my campus and I don't teach anything, you know? Uh, my, my description in my job title uh, through HR is faculty, but I don't teach, right? So is that counted towards that, that ratio that everybody's asking about? Is that counted as me being a faculty member with a student? No, it shouldn't be, right? And so the question you should be asking is student to teaching faculty ratio. What are the possibilities and what are the opportunities of me having a class with an actual professor with a terminal degree in that field? Uh, and not just a graduate assistant or a teaching assistant. Not saying graduate and teaching assistants aren't great because they are, they do help our professors a lot, especially the professors that are looking at, you know, undergraduate are doing a lot of research on top of what they're teaching. But you want the expert, right? Not the person that's learning from the expert because you're learning from the expert. That's, you're supposed to be learning from the expert, right? So those are questions you want to ask about size. Following that, location is the other important factor. You know, I, I used to talk about, location as just uh, the city or the suburbs or the rural area, right? Um, but it, you need to ask yourself again, what type of student you are? Uh, you, you know, as, as a first generation minority, I remember uh, my biggest issue was my focus. You know, I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a class clown. Uh, I'm the jokester in the class, right? I'm the one that always makes jokes and, and that's completely fine. So I knew the type of distraction that I, that I needed to avoid. Okay, so what type of distractions are in, are in each area? If you are an explorer, right? If you like to explore and culture, is it beneficial for you to go to a rural school where the closest thing to a, a, a live Broadway play is, you know, a, a theater above a bowling alley? No, think about that, right? What type of distractions are there not only to keep you, to distract you from schoolwork, but what distractions are there to keep you sane as a person as well, right? Mental health is something we don't talk enough about uh, as underrepresented students and, and first generation minority students. Um, but that distraction of what can I do outside of the classroom as well as inside of the, or what kind of type of distraction inside the classroom is important to me or do I need to avoid? That's something we need to talk about because there's over 4,000 colleges and universities here in the country, in the United States, right? And countless numbers across the world. Um, so what type of distractions are there? Are they in the city, the suburbs, the rural areas? Like, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of the students I talk to in the DMV, the uh, DC, Maryland, Virginia area where I recruit, they're so used to, you know, culture when it comes to food. Is it gonna be easy for them to go hit up a, a school that's in the Midwest? Probably not. It's gonna be a little bit of culture shock. and that. In itself can be effective, it can affect your, your school and your time at, in college, right? And then I've, I've added something new to my location slide, which is the distance from home. How comfortable are you being far from home? You know, uh, I, I recall my time looking at colleges and I wanted to go across the country. Uh, and being first generation Latino, uh, that wasn't, it wasn't happening, right? And I didn't understand that when I was 17, 18 years old that 
why can't I go to California, mom? And she's like, no. Uh, but it's one of those things that you need to have these discussions with your family. Um, parents may say no more than a four hour radius and you say no more than an eight hour radius. So how about you meet in the middle at a six hour radius, right? And, and that, that's when you're looking for the schools that, that best fits you location wise. And the other thing, think about our current situation with the pandemic, how, how frenzy it was when schools shut down in March. And if you are traveling across the country and, and the school is literally not kicking you out, but asking you to leave in a matter of 48 hours, think of that aspect and how those students who were traveling across the country, even across the world, were feeling and trying to find a flight to get out of there, right? So you have to keep that in the back of your mind. Our world isn't safe. Our country currently isn't safe, right? Something can happen at the drop of the dime uh, and you need to have a plan for getting home. Um, I, I've talked to colleagues that, like I said, I normally am the young dog on panels like this. Uh, and so talking to colleagues that have been in the game for over 30 years, the closest thing they can describe our current college going climate is back to September 11th of 2001, where students started looking closer to home uh, for that safety measure. And the distance from home doesn't just mean like leaving home to be away from your parents and to have that independence. You're going to get that even if you go an hour or two away, okay? Because you're going to make college what it, what it means to you, not what it means to your parents. But you also need to have that safety factor, especially us as underrepresented minority students. We need to feel safe on campus. And that distance from home plays a huge role into our, our feelings of safety, okay? Next slide, please. Uh, and Chris talked about this a little earlier. You know, what type of resources uh, do, do they offer? Uh, writing centers, tutoring, tutoring centers. I mentioned earlier mental health, counseling services. Are there free counseling services on your campus? Most schools do. I haven't heard of a school that doesn't, okay? Uh, and, and it's okay. I think your generation of students uh, has, has been more able, has the ability to talk about mental health is, has grown drastically. And it's something we do need to talk about, right? Um, and shying away from it in college, especially in for, for first generation students, that this is the first time you're leaving home. This is the first time anyone in your family is going through something that you're going through. Having someone to discuss this with, uh, whether at the professional level and a licensed level or a level like myself, Caitlin or Chris, who, who have been through this as well, these are questions you need to be able to find answers to. Because no one in your family, you can't call home to mom and dad and say, I, I'm, I'm, I feel sad because I'm here. I, you know, I'm surrounded by so, so many people, but I don't have anyone around me. Because uh, college is not an easy transition. It is leaning into the uncomfortable of putting yourself out there, uh, leaning into the uncomfortable of meeting new people, you know, uh, and even if you're extroverted like myself, it still is a, a comforting factor to be able to talk to somebody about what you're going through. Uh, and unfortunately, as much as your parents or your, or your grownups in your household uh, want to help you, if they've never experienced it, they, they can only be there to support you emotionally, but not the mental process that you're, that you're going through, right? First generation under, underrepresented student resources, uh, whether it be clubs and activities, whether it be, um, you know, our, our CDI office, the Center for, Diver Center for Diversity and Inclusion office, that's important to have too. Um, and then last but not least, short and long-term distance uh, disability assistance. I'm a klutz, go figure, right? Um, you know, long-term disability is great if you have a learning difference or anything like that, or, or, or a physical difference, um, that's perfect. But also the short-term, you gotta think about short-term. Like if you are walking down the stairs and it's icy, I went to school where it was cold and you slip and fall and you break an ankle, hi, that was me. You know, are they gonna be able to offer you an opportunity to get to classes a little bit uh, or, or talk to your professors about leaving class early to get to your next class because you're walking on crutches, right? So finding offices that, that'll help you with your, your differences, whether they be uh, learning or, or, or capabilities, that's something you need to look for when you're looking at these schools. Because uh, finding the best fit on the academic level is really important, like Caitlin mentioned in, in answering the questions of, are they early action? What type of test scores? All that stuff is great. 
Um, but finding the right fit academically so that you can grow academically is probably extremely important, if not more important than the first question that you're asking, right? Because they have to equal out. So finding the resources that'll help you grow academically and help you grow as a person, as I mentioned earlier, right? is what you're looking for when you're looking for the best academic fit and the social fit. Next slide, please. Um, when looking at colleges, I, you know, I, I, I go back and think of all the people in my life, some who had never been to college, who were telling me, oh, the school you're choosing is X, Y, Z and, and has this reputation and, uh, and, or, yo, you should go to so-and-so school. I heard they've got a great football team or like, Yo, they're on they're on ESPN every weekend, right? And and I call those ESPN schools. You know, don't don't worry so much about the brand name. You know, in the United States, we have over four thousand colleges and universities, like I mentioned earlier, and all of them are accredited, right? Or most of them are accredited. Look for the accredited ones. That's that's a hint, right? Look for the accredited ones, because uh, as long as they're accredited, they're going to be able to provide you with an opportunity to grow academically and, and as an individual. But what I mean by that is, don't worry about the brand name, is turn off the exterior noise. Uh, you know, a lot of people are gonna have an opinion of where you should go. Um, and it's not their opinion to give, you know, but you're polite, I get that. Most of us are polite people. Uh, and it's okay to be like, oh, thanks. And just keep moving, right? This is not your friend's choice. So where they're going to school shouldn't be the deciding factor on why you're applying there or going to school there. It should be a plus, it should be an added, but not the deciding factor, right? It's not your aunties or uncles or grandmas or grandparents decision, maybe a little bit of grandma and grandpa because they have a little more sway on who we are as a person, you know, because they spoil us so much. But um, it really should be your decision and your decision alone. There's a difference between finding an opinion and getting advice. And that's an important factor and you need to, you need to realize before going into this whole academic, uh, whole college search, right? Um, and then it's completely okay to tell people I'm still weighing all my options when they ask you, oh, so where are you going to apply? You know, when you get to the Thanksgiving holiday, a lot of people are going to be like, oh, where are you applying to college? Hey, I don't know. I'm still weighing out my options, right? Um, my, my favorite quote is if they aren't paying for it, their opinion shouldn't matter. So next slide, please. Financial aid, FAFSA, uh, the free app, and I, I capitalize free because it's, it's a, you need to understand it is free and it opens up tomorrow. It is October tomorrow. So never paid uh, to submit your FAFSA. Understand the FAFSA, the way it works is you fill out the FAFSA every year that you're in school. And when you fill it out for the first time as a rising freshman or an ingoing freshman, you select all the schools that you are sending it to and then each school evaluates your FAFSA form based in the context of their respective institution. So just because you're sending it to the three of us, Caitlin, Christopher, and myself, uh, our financial aid packets are gonna re look real different because one, our sticker price is different. Uh, the way we're able to give money out is different. So don't ever call another university and say, well, I heard f and is gonna give me X, Y, and Z. No, the financial aid that the school is giving you is specific to their institution. So it's not like you're filling out the FAFSA, it gets sent to the federal government and then they decide what they're giving you. No, it's the individual institution that's deciding what they're gonna give you. Um, next slide, please. I'm trying to be conscious of time. Um, CSS profile, the College Scholarship Service Profile. Uh, it's an online application and it's based in the United States. Uh, it allows institutions a more in-depth look, not only at your financial situation, but your family situation. Right, which uh, it helps the schools like uh, mostly private in, private in, uh, private institutions um, try to figure out what type of institutional aid they can provide you from their own endowment money, right? Like not money from state, not money from the federal government, but from their specific uh, pot of money, right? CSS profile, uh, I joked with my colleagues when we were talking about this earlier, uh, the FAFSA is kind of like a yearly checkup. The CSS profile is a colonoscopy. It's a little more invasive. They're asking more in-depth questions. Uh, and there is a $25 fee included for each one of them. Um, but like Caitlin said, uh, we do have, a lot of schools have the, the fee waiver through College Board and it's for eligible students dependent on a lot of different factors. Next slide, and I think we're done. Any questions? Oh, 845, exactly, look at that. That's great.
Okay, so there is one question in the Q&A right now um, that asks, do we need to submit the financial forms like CSS profile, ISFAA before the ED deadline or can we submit it after submitting the common application? That is a great question. Um, so it really depends on when you're in relation to early decision, um, each school will have sort of a deadline that they have. So um, it's important to check their website, uh, their financial aid website or like the Office of Financial Aid and see when those deadlines are. So like, for example, at f &M, with our ED appl applicants, the financial aid deadline is the same as the ED application deadline. So November 15th and then January 15th for our financial aid. Um, but some schools may be different. It may be after, it may be before. It's usually not before, but it's important to check the websites because in particular to early decision, it is it can be different. And then if my colleagues have anything else to, to add to that. Uh, I'm, Caitlin hit it nail on the head. Every school is gonna be different. There's 4,000 colleges and universities. There's gonna be 4,000 different processes. Um, so engaging, like Chris mentioned, is going to be extremely important while you go throughout this process. Finding that counselor that re, uh, recruits your territory or, or, or read for your territory is going to be extremely vital in that aspect. So, Any other questions? Feel free to utilize Q&A, the chat box. Hopefully people are quiet, which means that we provided good information. <laughs> that's, that's always my default. Um, Luis, there was a point in the chat that someone wrote good points about distance from home. So kudos about that, which that was good advice. <laughs> I didn't consider that. So that was helpful. Neither did I. I was ready to go across <laughs> the country and leave uh, you know, the, the wind beneath my mother's wings real quickly. And she reminded me, hey, you still got some growing up to do. So I want you to stay a little closer so that you can still grow, but on your own. So as we wait for more questions, I mean, I have a question for our panelists, which I think um, is really helpful for students to hear. It's sort of a piece of advice, you know, because we provided a lot of information um, to you all, information that we think is really pertinent. Um, but I wanna hear sort of a piece of advice from each of us to the students, to the parents, to maybe the counselors that may be on the line um, about the college process or about engagement that may be helpful um, to our students, you know, you know, we're anything. Um, one piece of advice that I would give uh, to students, especially with the stresses of, of the pandemic now and trying to get your application out to as many schools is um, be a high school student applying to college and not a college applicant. Like your job is to be a high school student. Enjoy what's left of your senior year. Um, so you, you're going to be pressured into applying to a bunch of different schools because a lot of test optional policies are opening up and you know, schools that you in the past may not have admitted you, they're going to have a different outlook this year. Uh, so feeling that you need to be that college applicant is going to be there, not from your, maybe not from your parents or, or your, or your home community, but maybe from the community at school or, or just societal pressures, right? So be a high school student applying to college, not a college applicant. Um, and, and don't be afraid to, to look outside the box, you know, don't worry about the brand name. Because uh, uh, this is going to college is a decision between Kutztown University and Radford University. It's not a decision between going to Yale and jail. Okay. Um, I would also add on to a point that Luis made uh, earlier about um, like it really is not about who you are. Like the college is not going to be like your defining factor for the rest of your life. I actually really want to underline that. I think that can reduce a lot of the anxiety. Um, just remembering that, because I think in my mind too, again, it felt like the curtain just dropped. It was like, I get to college and then I just kind of skate off 
into some kind of constant state of happiness, which isn't, I wouldn't want that anyway, because I hopefully would continue to grow. Um, and I think it's really good to keep that in mind. Um, you will continue growing after college. I mean, without a doubt. <laughs> um, and it's a really interesting stepping stone in the process, but it is not any kind of defining factor who's going to shape everything about who you are. Um, it is exactly what you take out of it. And you can you can be at the best quote unquote school in the world where everyone will agree, yep, that's the best school in the world. But if you don't take advantage of it, it it's it won't matter. So it's that gives you a lot of agency because you can make you can bring to the situation wherever you are all of your curiosity and your desire to grow and figure out your values. Um, so that's my encouragement. It's meant to be empowering and uh, relieving. And my sort of advice is also it's supposed to be a fun process, right? You're starting the next chapter in your life and you, it should not cause you stress. Um, and also remember, this is a human process. We're not robots. We're people. Hopefully you feel like we're approachable. Um, <laughs> we uh, we want to help students. Um, so know to be in touch with us, know to reach out and know that this process should be fun because you are also learning about yourself, um, as Louise pointed out. Um, so definitely uh, there's one more. So yeah, just have fun. Uh, there's one more question before we end. Um, if I am a postgraduate, what academic records are considered? The high school records or the postgrad records? So they're in a PG year. Does anyone go ahead, Louise? D depending on what program you're applying to, it's going to be it's going to be vital of what you're providing um, for for students like. A postgraduate, you know, we're, we are traditionally looking at the high school grades, mm -hmm. um, but if you're taking like that postgraduate year uh, at a at an academy or something like that, that's also supposed to that's also not just supposed to be there as like a gap year. It's also supposed to be there to expand on your academics, right? So mm -hmm. I think most schools are looking at it as as look at both parts of it, but definitely depending on the major that you're applying to, if you're applying to a big state school where you're applying to a, a specific program, you know, if you're applying to engineering, you want to see the math and sciences, right? So it's one of those things that it's going to depend on each school. So definitely take a look at what, you're, uh, what each school is requiring. Exactly. Great answer. All righty. Well, please feel free to be in touch with us. If you do have any questions afterward, you can find us all on our college's website. Um, so please be in touch and thank you for joining us this morning. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Um, all right, bye everyone. See you, see you later. <laughs>